Hey guys, this is Hannah and this is Bookworms Talk, and today we're going to talk about The Sea of Tranquility by Katya Malay. This is a story about Nastaya Koshnikov, a former piano prodigy, and then one day everything was taken from her. Something happened to her. She was murdered, and her left hand was crushed into hundreds of pieces, and she can never play the piano the same way again. That was her dream. And now without that, she's left with pretty much nothing, and all she has is this harbor and hatred for the boy who murdered her. It's not that Nastaya wants to die, but that she believes that she should be dead. And then there's Josh Bennett, who has lost everyone he's ever loved up until the age of 17. Now everyone's gone, and he just wants to be left alone, and that's exactly what happens. Because when everyone around you dies, you tend to be left alone at school. But then Nastaya comes, and she starts slowly putting herself into every aspect of his life, as much as a person can, one that doesn't speak. That's right. She doesn't speak. She's mute. Not that she can't speak, but that she won't. And they kind of had this unspoken agreement that they don't ask each other about their pasts. And we, we get to find out pieces of their past and we get to grieve with them. But don't get me wrong, while this sounds really depressing, and it does have its points, I sometimes forgot that I was supposed to be upset. I found myself laughing. There were so many funny parts and I'm going to share a couple of them with you. It was hardly an attack. It was more of a sort of lame insult version of karaoke. Panty Combusting Kin comes complete with Piked Princess Barbie, Unachievable Measurements, Designer Purse, and Annoyed Scal included. Black stilettos, four and a half inches of insanity. She looks like she belongs in a copper tone ad. I look like I belong in a coffin. The writing style, while discussing a serious subject, would then twist it somehow, and I don't know how to quite describe it, so I'm gonna read you one example. I'd sit in a circle, and a bunch of people who'd been through as much shit as I had would look at me like I snuck into the club without paying the cover and I'd feel like screaming and telling them that I had paid it, the same as everyone else in this room. I just didn't feel like waving around my receipt. It's just things like that where it's like a serious subject matter, but then like waving around my receipt and it's these great phrases and these great analogies that she uses and it's just, that's what made me love this book so much. Don't get me wrong, I loved the story, but the writing style seriously sold me. And I kind of thought that this whole story was gonna be this thing about revenge, but it really, really wasn't. It was about the dream of second chances. I want to start talking details, so I'll see you guys later next time when you have read it. Bye! So she meets this guy, Drew, and he is a walking, talking Ken doll with a panty-combusting smile, and he labels her his latest conquest. But the thing is, she just finds him amusing as all hell, and they get to be great friends, and I love Drew so much. I will get to describing my level of love for that kid. I love that she collects names. It's like the quirkiest little thing that you could think of. All of the names mean something. When I write stories, I love using names that mean things. I really love the quote where Josh described Nastea as this optical illusion. You look at her from one angle and you get this really clear picture and then she turns and everything just shifts and you don't know what the original picture was anymore. She really is an enigma. So when Drew drops Nastea off at Josh is a house and she is drunk and stumbling and there's this whole conversation. I dropped off a really hot drunk girl who doesn't talk off at your house. That's like a gift. And Josh says, I didn't realize you were being a friend and giving me an unresponsive drunk girl to rape. Next time be a little clearer for me so I don't miss such a golden opportunity. And I think that day that kind of jump started him and Nastaya's friendship. So Nastaya goes running really late at night and she doesn't think of where she's going and she ends up this house, this yellow house with the garage. She has a feeling that she's seen it before somewhere. She goes in and it's Josh's garage. It's Josh. And this day is kind of jealous that he can create these things with, these, with his hands because that was taken from her. And so she continues to stay in his garage and quietly watch him without speaking. And then one day she decides to ask about the saws. And I'm like, of all things that you would first say, you ask about the saws. And let me be clear, they're not completely nice to each other. I mean, they're like that love, hate, mean, nice sort of thing going on that I can't... They're an oxymoron. That's what they are. It's not like they jump into this automatic BFF relationship here. No, it's a weird growth. And then he built her a chair. And it wasn't just a chair. It was an invitation. It said that she was welcomed there, that she was accepted there. He gave her a place to belong. Josh watches General Hospital, and I was like, Okay, my willing suspension of disbelief is out the window at this point. No 17-year-old boy, straight 17-year-old boy, watches General Hospital. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. But then it's explained to us that 
That's what his mother watched religiously. And from eight years old, he's watched it since because he thought if his mother ever comes back that he would want to tell her what happened. And now it's just happened and he does it. And it's like this piece of his mom and it's... <laughs> and when they eat ice cream, she wants to eat around the edges because that's the melty part. That's the best part of the ice cream. And then she makes him eat the more frozen center. And I'm like, whoa, we share schemas here. That's what I do. And I completely went through an entire pint of ice cream reading this book. Normally, with books, I'll just drink a bunch of coffee or drink a bunch of tea. I drink a whole pint of ice cream. Whole pint. And so I kind of felt like they knew each other so well and made me feel like I knew them so well just by those little things and the quirks that they have. And so Josh calls Nastaya sunshine and at first I don't really think it was a term of endearment so much as just something to annoy her but it turns into this thing of endearment. It's Josh's thing to call her sunshine not true and so she finds it important enough to say something. Call me sunshine again and I will murder you cocksucker. I just did that. <laughs> that was so funny. So Josh accidentally slices his hand and then he decides to go running with Nastaya because that is her therapy. And then Josh tells Sunshine about the story that his grandfather told him. He said there wasn't really any form or sense to it, that it was a feeling without knowing, like a fever dream, like the dream of second chances. He said the only part of it that had definition was a porch swing in front of a red brick house, but he didn't know what it meant at the time. He didn't say anything about it to anyone. Then he showed me this old picture of him sitting with my grandmother on a porch swing in front of a red brick house she lived in when they met. And so Josh told Sunshine about the story that his grandfather told him that when he died, what he saw... <laughs> the Sea of Tranquility is a place on the moon, but it's not a sea, it's just a big dark shadow. And at first she thought that that would be a great place to die because it sounds so peaceful, like you're being surrounded by water, but then it was, it's just a lie. Just because it has that name doesn't make it something true. It, on her birthday when her parents came and pretty much ambushed her, Josh took her to the fountains with a bucket of pennies. She wished her hand would work again, and he wished that his mom was there, not for him, but that so his mom could meet her. God, then Lee fucking shows up. I really thought that Sunshine would be a lot more pissed about that than she was. I would have been more pissed, but nonetheless, they spend that next morning together, and Josh buys her this hideous ceramic hat. She calls it Voldemort, and I'm not even a Harry Potter fan, but I appreciate that. Then Josh tells her how he told Drew that Sunshine was his, and he's like, I, I lied. I said you were mine. And then before she leaves, she says, you didn't lie. So Sunshine was going through the names with Mrs. Layton, and she asked what Josh's name meant, and it meant salvation. Then Mrs. Layton says that Josh needs to fix things to be the hero. But the fact of the matter is that Josh is the one that needs the saving. So Sunshine and Josh sleep together, and she's a virgin. And then after, she just cries, and I'm just as confused as Josh is. And now she says that she's ruined and she used him to finish ruining her. And then he calls her Nastea for the first time. He doesn't call her Sunshine. And she, he tells her to get the fuck out of his house. And I am so confused why, she cho why she's ruined. But then I kind of settle on the fact that self-loathing doesn't really need to have a lot of reasons. You hate yourself because you do. I think she felt ever since she was 15 that she was worthless. And she's kind of slowly tried to make it more of a fact, you know? Like this was the last pure thing about her and she just wanted everything to just be ru ruined and I don't understand it, but like I said, self-loathing doesn't have logic to it. So Sunshine goes to this party with Drew and then Kevin finds her and ambushes her in the bedroom and almost rapes her and he knocks her around some and then Drew comes in there and he just beats the hell out of him and that's not Drew at all. Drew is this easygoing guy and it's, just, it's not him. And then they go to Josh's and they walk in and they hear him having sex with Lee. So Sunshine goes to this art thing with Clay and he's there. He, as in the boy that murdered her, the boy that ruined her dreams and crushed her hand, he is there. Aiden Richter. Aiden didn't just take her piano from her. She can't have children and she has all this damage now and he took so much more than just her piano. But then you have to look at it like he didn't take your life. He didn't take her, he didn't steal her virginity. I mean, he didn't take everything, but it just feels like everything. And then somehow, because Aiden's story was that he walked in and found his brother had just killed himself. And he was mad because he blamed it on this Russian whore. That was why he blamed, that's who he blamed his brother's death on. And he saw her walking. That's why he chose her. It was out of random. And that is why she became the Russian whore. And I think she just wanted to become almost what he thought that she was and become worthless. And I think that's a little bit behind the self-loathing aspect. And she 
said she was sorry to Aiden. I didn't really peg her to be that big of a person, and that's not a negative thing, it's just the reality. And, and Aiden had the painting of her hand held open, holding the pearl that she could have never, that she never reached. So Aiden turned himself in and Sunshine was missing, and Josh is like, I wasn't supposed to have to do this again. That was everybody, it was all of them, until her. Everyone was gone, and then he let her into his life. So she comes back and she tells her parents, she speaks for the first time and says, that she's remembered everything since the day that she stopped talking. And they find her notebooks, the three pages of the same story that she wrote every single night to ward off the nightmares of what happened to her. And that night, Josh stays in her bed with her. And then Drew sleeps on the floor of her bedroom because they don't want to be away from her. That scene made me cry because Drew, I love Drew. You have this idea of who he is from the very beginning and he just, he breaks every idea that we had of him. And he's really a really good person. And then Sunshine's mother walks in there while she's still sleeping and the guys are awake. And she asks Josh what he is to her. And then Drew fills in and says, family, and it's so true. And then the next chapter is not titled Nastea, it's titled Amelia. And Amelia says, you couldn't have saved me and I can't save you. And then Josh says, Amelia, every day you save me. The one thing she didn't want from Josh, the unforgivable thing, was that she did not want him to fall in love with her and he just said, you know what, I don't give a shit, Sunshine, because I love you. With the letter that she wrote to the courts, she said that she won't forgive Aiden, but maybe there are second chances for both of them. Josh asked her what she saw when she died before, and she said, your garage. His garage was his grandmother's swing to his grandfather, and oh, my emotions, so many tears. And then ever since the art show and Aiden was there, I was <laughs> tears were there the whole time. There were spots where I did cry, but then we would have funny things. I haven't had a book that's done that, where it's this seriously sad thing. But I wouldn't be able to stay sad at it for very long. I would know it's there, but I would function still. And it was a lot like how Sunshine and Josh were, how they're still aware of all these things that have happened, but they're able to function. There's this one conversation that Josh and Sunshine had. Sunshine said, just so you know, one day I'm going to get tired of sharing your affection with that coffee table and I'm going to make you choose. And he said, just so you know, I would chop that table up and use it for firewood before I would ever choose anything over you. This book had its funny parts and it has intense parts and it had its just why my heart parts. And it was a beautiful story and I loved it so much and recommend it to people, seriously. I want to have a special thank you for Stephanie for gifting me this. It was so good, thank you. And I thank you for everybody that's been telling me that I needed to read it because it was so worth every second that I spent. I will see you guys later next time on Bookworms Talk. Bye!